Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin today by reading a verse from 1 John. I'm going to read 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There are other scriptures which support this claim that God is willing to forgive our sins. But there are also some verses that seem to indicate this is not always the case. I'm going to read three in fairly rapid succession. We will visit them all later, so I suggest you not bother turning to them for this first quick read. The first is Matthew 12, verse 31 through 32. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. The second is Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And the third is in Hebrews also, verse, chapter 10, verse 26 through 31. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be, he be thought worthy who has him trampled the Son of God underfoot counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the eternal will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. These verses are describing what has come to be called the unpardonable sin. Today I would like to look at this condition. Just what is the unpardonable sin? How easy is it to commit this sin? And is it possible that you may have committed it already? I'm going to begin by pointing out several principles that we learn from scripture. First principle, God expects us to forgive anyone who repents. In Luke 17, verse 3, Luke 17, 3, Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And in Matthew 18, Matthew 18 and verse 21, we read that Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. God expects us to have patience, love, mercy, compassion, and forgiveness towards our brother. Why? Because he is developing his nature in us. God expects us to forgive anyone who truly repents because that is what he does. And God is infinitely more merciful and compassionate than we are. 
Principle number two, God wants everyone to repent and be saved. In 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, and verse 9, we read that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In principle number three, we know that with God all things are possible, but there are some things that are illogical impossibilities, contradictions that in practice are indeed impossible. And these logical contradictions are impossible even for God to reconcile. The same scriptures that say with God all things are possible also say that it is impossible for God to lie. Why? Because it is a logical contradiction. God cannot be perfect, inherently living and enforcing his righteous law, and at the same time violate it. But another thing that is impossible for God to create, for God, is to create character by fiat, by decree, or command. By definition, character is the ability of an individual to know right from wrong, and then to choose the right on his own. God has not created us to be automatons. God has created us to be free moral agents. We are required to choose. And while God could force us to choose the right, and sometimes probably does, you might think of the manna in the wilderness where the Israelites were forced to get, pick up manna every day. They were forced to pick up twice as much on Friday and forced to not do so on the Sabbath. That is not character. Until we get to the place where we make such choices on our own, we have not developed the character he requires. At the end of their lives, two of Israel's great leaders elaborated on this. Moses delivered the book of Deuteronomy possibly all in one day, and near the end, he gave this testimony in Deuteronomy 30, Deuteronomy 30, and verse 15. Deuteronomy 30, and verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the eternal your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the eternal your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn, drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that, you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the eternal your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the eternal swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. And Joshua 2, Joshua um, also in uh, chapter 24, right near the end of his, his life, Joshua 24 and verse 14. Now therefore fear the eternal, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the eternal. And if it seems evil for you to serve the eternal, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the eternal. Even in the Garden of Eden, 
Adam and Eve were forced to choose, to decide whether to obey or not, or to take the knowledge and determination of what is good and what is evil to themselves. God cannot make us repent. Repentance is not just being sorry, but involves a mental determination to change. God can force us to obey in some cases, and he can make our lives miserable if we don't, and he can make us sorry for the suffering we go through, but he cannot make us repent to respond to his efforts to help us see our sin and permanently change. And this, brethren, is the key to the unpardonable sin. This word unpardonable is not in most translations. It is a word we humans have placed on this type of sin. But the word often gives the impression that God is like us. Perhaps he is loving and merciful and forgiving up to a point. But that there are some things God won't forgive. Brethren, this is simply not true. His mercy never fails, as the scriptures say. He is always ready to forgive. These are not unforgivable sins, sins that God won't forgive under any circumstances. They are sins that God cannot, or perhaps I should say God will not forgive because the sinner won't repent. They are unpardonable because God won't pardon a sin that is unrepented of. Now there are some tough sins to overcome and the scriptures don't ignore them. Let's think first of the parable of the sheep and the goats. We find this in chapter 25 of Matthew. The sheep were commended for helping and ministering to others. And then in Matthew 25 and verse 41, we read about the goats, Matthew 25 and verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. The goats neglected their duty could not understand why they were, but they could not understand why they're being condemned. And in verse 44, they it says, they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them saying, assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And though these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The parable pronounces a dire punishment, apparently even the lake of fire. I ask you, what is the punishment for everyone who does not repent? Isn't it the lake of fire? So do these goats repent? It doesn't say. We hope they do and we strive to not be among them. And if they repent, will God refuse to hear them? That isn't what he expects of us. I don't expect it of God. He will hear them. But the sin of neglect is not as obvious as some others and may take some effort to deal with. What is the hardest sin to overcome? I've heard it suggested and tend to agree that it is the sin of self-righteousness. Those who justify themselves or blame and condemn others don't have an easy time of it. What was the main difference between King Saul and King David? They both did things wrong. Saul was told to wipe out the Amalekites he was sent to attack and all of their possessions. He saved many of the animals alive and the king himself. Later, he offered a sacrifice that he was not authorized to do and which he had specifically been told he should wait for Samuel to make. But Saul 
blamed the people for his transgressions. He protested that he had obeyed God, but the circumstances had required that he change the orders. In contrast, David did some far worse things than Saul, but he blamed nobody. When his sins were pointed out, he accepted responsibility and pleaded for mercy and forgiveness. Saul was self-righteous. So were the Pharisees. Can God work with them? The entire book of Job shows how God worked with one man to overcome that problem. God does some amazing work when dealing with his creation. Let's look at another problem. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 and verse 15. Hebrews 12, 15 through 17. Looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Bitterness can be a big problem. But he continues and says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Esau found it hard to repent. In fact, his proposed solution was to kill his brother. Did he eventually repent? Can he eventually repent? I doubt God is finished with him yet. So who has committed an unpardonable sin? Only God knows. He will work with anyone to bring them to repentance. For those he cannot persuade to change, the like of fire being removed from existence awaits. But God does not easily give up on us. What about the Pharisees? They were the objects of Jesus' condemnation throughout his ministry. It was the scribes and Pharisees he was addressing when he gave that first warning I read from Matthew about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the parallel account in Mark. In Mark 3, Mark 3, and verse 22. Mark 3, 22. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. So he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, he is divided. He cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. And then it continues, verses 28 through 30 in Mark 3. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter, even against him, as it says in Matthews. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. Was he telling them that they had insulted him and the insult would be forgiven, but if they had insulted the Holy Spirit, they would be in real trouble? Or was he telling them that they had insulted him, that if they had insulted him, that would be, have been okay, but since they blasphemed the Holy Spirit, then they were even now in big trouble? It doesn't really matter. The real question is, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Is this just a semantic technicality? He is personally okay with insults? But there's a third person in a trinity that is a lot more sensitive than he is and won't tolerate it? No, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, the very power and nature of God, has to do with denying 
the power and authority of God. The Pharisees were trying to attribute the healing to the power of Satan. If we or the Pharisees get to the point that we repudiate God's power and authority in our lives, then we are in danger of getting to a point where we just don't care anymore. There is no longer any reason to overcome and no power to do it. And just how bad were these Pharisees? He said the men of Nineveh would rise to condemn them and it would even be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the judgment. He said if they were blind, they would have an excuse. But since they said they weren't blind, their sin remained. Self-righteousness was a big problem with them and they could not see it. These men were so filled with hate but they stopped their ears and ran upon Stephen to stone him. Have they then committed an unpardonable sin, something they are incapable of repenting of? Paul was one of those consenting to the stoning of Stephen. And look at what God was able to do with him. The scriptures say many Pharisees were converted. Each of the Pharisees will be worked with individually and judged according to his own heart and mind and whether he is capable of repenting of his sin. What about Judas? Jesus said of Judas that it would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Why? Because he has been condemned to the lake of fire? Judas saw what he, had, what he did wrong. He made an attempt to fix it. It was too late and he took his life over his grief. But his reputation is destroyed. If you were resurrected to face a world that knew you primarily as the one who betrayed our Savior and about the only other thing they knew about you is that you were a thief, wouldn't you also wish that you had never been born? You know, it's interesting regarding Job, I mentioned earlier. You know what the first speech he gave to his friends was when he finally decided to comment on his condition? Job 3 is an entire chapter about how he wished he had never been born. And that was only because of his personal trauma, not for something the whole world was down on him for. Can Judas overcome that stigma and repent? I don't know. But if he can, will God refuse to accept that? Perhaps a human would hold a grudge, but I'm persuaded that this is not the nature and character of God. But didn't he betray the Son of God and cause his death? My friends, Jesus was crucified because of our sins, not because Judas betrayed him. And what about church members who fall away? This is the primary subject of the passages we read about in Hebrews. Let's go back to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 and verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. When we are baptized, the sacrifice of Jesus is applied in our lives. We are reconciled to God through his death. And then through Christ living in us, we are saved by his life. Oh, that that was the end. But at some point we find we sin again. Now what? We need the blood of Christ to atone for us again. Do we not in effect crucify again the Son of God? What did the author of Hebrews mean by this? I think it is apparent that he was referring 
to the literal crucifixion by those who hated this man and wanted him dead. Those who have truly fallen away to where they wish to crucify the Son of God all over again to get rid of him in their lives are not easily going to repent. Indeed, it may be impossible for them to do so. And this concept is very much related to the other passage in Hebrews, which ties all of the unpardonable sin passages together, and we'll find that in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 said, verse 26, if we willfully, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. What does it mean to sin willfully? Other translations, translations say deliberately. This is more than sinning willingly. We have probably all been guilty of that. This is what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. This happens to all of us, possibly. But have all those committed the unpardonable sin? Let's go back to Hebrews. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fire indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? crucified him again, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace, blasphemed the Holy Spirit. So what about those who have given up on their calling, including friends and family? Can they repent? Will they repent? Again, I can't answer that. Only they working with God can answer that. What if they fall asleep before they repent? Can they still repent after being resurrected? Yes, but will they? Again, I can't answer that, but I know this. If they don't, it will not be because God will not permit it. It will be because they won't do it. I suspect many of them will be of the same mindset that one of the apostles was. In John 20, John 20, verse 24. John 20, 24. But Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of his nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, the disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We who have been called in this age have not seen the reality of God's kingdom. We take it on faith, and we believe what God says. We see evidence of our lives, in our lives, and in the lives of those around us. Those who God works with after his return, however, will see the reality of God's kingdom. Will some of these people, 
Will most of these people who have given up repent once they see that reality? It may not be easy for some of them. Let's take a look at a passage in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true pro proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to the wallowing in the mire. Many who have fallen away are not even hostile. For them, it may be relatively easy. There is little doubt that God will succeed in working with them. But as with Judas, will those who are hostile be able to overcome the stigma of having been given an opportunity to be in the better resurrection and then to have thrown it away? I hope they will, but we really can't answer this now. And what about us? Have some of us committed an unpardonable sin? My friends, any sin we commit is a sin God will not forgive if we won't repent of having done it and seek forgiveness and change. As every minister in the church of God who counsels those who come to them about this question is asked, are you worried you may have committed an unpardonable sin? Are you sorry you did it, whatever it may be? If so, then it is inconceivable that you have committed an unpardonable sin. The sin is only unpardonable if we make it so. And what if we keep making the same mistakes, the same sins? Are you hopeless and unforgivable? Will God keep forgiving you? What did he tell Peter? I don't think 70 times 7 was an absolute limit. Again, does, God, does eternal life matter to you? Does it bother you when you have sinned? Or don't you care anymore? And will you continue to not care if God turns up the heat, either in this life or after a resurrection? Developing character takes time. But as long as you are willing to let God work with you, he won't give up on you. Even if it takes more time than this life allows. God is creating sons and daughters. He has an amazing plan and possesses infinite patience to work with us. He has incredible wisdom in dealing with some hard cases, as we've seen. But we must ourselves, of our own free will, develop the mind of God through his spirit. And that means repenting of what we are, not just what we have done, and to change. If we completely turn our backs on that calling, if we refuse to repent or to continue to repent when necessary, if we refuse to change our lives, then God will put us out of our misery. As I said at the beginning, I read at the beginning out of the first epistle of John, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God does not refuse to forgive us. He works patiently with us, even if we seem to be a pretty hard case. But whether we ultimately commit sins that God will not be able to pardon because we won't let him is entirely up to us.